Welcome to the Monocle Podcast. We are an independent management consulting firm, and in this podcast, we discuss our latest insights and opinions to help you achieve exceptional performance in banking and insurance together. Welcome to the Monocle Insights Podcast. It's our first one for 2022. Very excited to be back. I'm Guy Wilding, Monocle's Research Manager based in Johannesburg. And on today's episode, we have a, a very relevant topic for the year 2022. And we're joined by Ntutuko Ngomazulu, one of our senior executives at Monocle, to chat about bank resolution, as well as the various initiatives that the Financial Sector Laws Amendment Bill is bringing into South African banking this year. So, Titi, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Guy. Really appreciate you having me on the podcast and really excited to be talking about bank resolution today. Thank you. So, so one of the one of the things we mentioned up top is that a big bank regulation that's coming through is the the promulgation um, of the financial sector laws amendment bill, and that's primarily focused on reforming bank resolution within South Africa. Um, and I think currently in its state, it should be promulgated and enacted into law quite soon. So, a super relevant topic. But I think before we get onto the the details around bank resolution, maybe you can just explain to us what it is. And why is it so important? Why should we have a podcast on it in in 2022? Yeah, so bank resolution in simple terms is the restructuring of a bank to avoid a bailout, right? Now, this is done through a variety of tools that are designed to, you know, safeguard public interest, you know, including your continuity of your bank's critical functions, as well as financial stability, all at minimal cost to the taxpayer, right? So essentially how this works is that the bank supervisor would first attempt to recover the bank's financial situation using the bank's recovery plan. Now, if the recovery fails, then three conditions will then need to be met to enter into a resolution, right? And the first is that the central bank would need to determine that the entity is either failing or is likely to fail, right? Secondly, private sector measures or, you know, supervisory actions must have been explored or even exhausted at this stage, right? And lastly, the resolution would need to be in the best interest of the public. Now, you know, once the SARB is satisfied that the criteria for the triggering of the point of resolution has been met, it can then make recommendations to the finance minister to put the bank into the resolution. And this is where it will have the full set of resolution powers or tools at its disposal in order to recover the bank's financial situation without any significant adverse effect to the country's financial system. Now, in order to really understand the importance of bank resolution, we'd have to go all the way back to the global financial crisis in 2007. And, you know, one of the biggest rev- revelations of that period was that, you know, when it came to failure, banks needed to be treated differently. and This is largely because of the degree of their interconnectedness with the financial system and the fact that banks are just too big to fail. So since then, there has been a commitment by G20 countries to implement specific key attributes of effective resolution regimes for financial institutions. And given that South Africa is a member of the G20, there has been a review of existing banking uh, resolution framework required locally. And this is where certain deficiencies were identified that both financial institutions as well as regulators will need to align to and incorporate into the upcoming FS Lab. Thanks, Titi. And I know you were talking about the bank failures and bailouts. Um, and they're, they're rare events, but they do happen. Um, and there are a lot of kind of front of mind examples that we think about, you know, specifically 2008, um, the global financial crisis with the U.S. government having to uh, bail out financial organizations. So, you know, we read about it in The the End of Money as well, one of the books that uh, our CEOs are written and published talking about these exact events, Bear Stearns as well as AIG. And so now there's this concept of a bail-in. You mentioned the bail-out, but the bail-in um, is kind of now this new way of um, aiming at preventing the fallout of a bank um, and a bank failure uh, falling on taxpayers, which has been quite a, a big problem going forward in that while banks were taking on all this risk, it wasn't ultimately them that uh, would would take the responsibility for failure created quite a lot of um, mistrust in the banking system. So maybe you can explain to us what a bail-in is um, and what does it mean for bank resolution um, in South Africa? Yeah, so, you know, in the key attributes that I mentioned earlier, they actually set out uh, three main resolution tools that the central bank can use to restore and maintain critical functions of the bank. 
Now, the first is the power to create something called a bridge entity or a temporary institution, right, for the continuation of, you know, critical functions. And this also works to serve the purpose of splitting your good bank from your bad bank, etc. right? Now, the second tool is the ability to transfer the bank's assets and liabilities to a new acquiring institution or even the bridge entity itself. Now, the third and final tool is what we call a bail-in. Now, this is where losses are essentially applied to selected creditors and shareholders in order to recapitalize a bank. So there are various mechanisms that the Reserve Bank has available to do this. And this includes they could partially or fully divest shareholders of their shares. They could reduce or cancel the claims of specific creditors. Um, And they can even convert the claims of creditors to equity. So, you know, almost in the form of a debt for equity swap. And the only difference in this case would be that the decision to enter into a swap would actually sit with the Reserve Bank itself. So, you know, essentially the idea behind all of these mechanisms is really to repair the bank's balance sheet using its own resources. So very different to your traditional bailout, where, you know, the government would essentially use taxpayers' money to inject capital into the banks to enable them to continue their operations. So you mentioned about the debt to equity swaps. And one of the main um, objectives is to ensure recapitalization, going through the updated credit hierarchy to protect depositors more throughout that process of resolution. Um, And they've introduced a new financial instrument called a FLAC instrument or first loss absorbing capacity debt uh, instrument um, that will enable um, these bail-in resolutions. So what are FLAC in instruments? If you can maybe give us a little bit more detail behind them and how will they ensure banks can be recapitalized if they enter resolution? Yeah, so when it comes to the recapitalization via resolution actions, you know, there are certain safeguards that would need to be put in place in order to ensure that creditors aren't suffering an excessive loss of value during the process of resolving a bank, right? Now, one of the safeguards that has been proposed is the amendment of the bank's creditor hierarchy. And this is basically to ensure that no creditor should be worse off in a resolution than would be in, you know, an otherwise normal liquidation. Now, one of the biggest changes to the proposed amended hierarchy is the introduction of a new tranche of loss-absorbing debt instruments. And this is known as the FLAC instruments. Now, these funding instruments would essentially then be subordinate to your other secured liabilities, but would be senior to your regulatory instruments or your regulatory capital instruments in the credit hierarchy. So very similar in concept to something like your total loss absorbing capacity requirements, which would apply to globally systematically important banks. So what the inclusion of such a debt instrument essentially does in the context of a bail-in is that it raises the funding that can be used to absorb the losses of a failing bank once it's placed into resolution. And then it also provides the capacity for the bank to be recapitalized during this process. The next thing we want to chat about, and it's a big development that we've seen over the last few months, has been deposit insurance and the establishment of a a new supervisory institute, uh, CODI, so the Corporation for Deposit Insurance. And uh, yeah, last year we had Abu Nadat on the podcast, and he took us through a lot of the details around what CODI hopes to achieve and the deposit insurance and the implementation of that at the banks. Maybe you can just give us a kind of a brief reminder of how deposit insurance fits into bank resolution and what's been kind of progressing over the last few months. Yeah, what does 2022 hold for the major banks with deposit insurance? So as part of the strengthening of the resolution framework, banks will be required to establish a deposit insurance fund, which is essentially aimed at protecting the depositors of a bank by covering and paying out the balances of their deposits in the event of failure. And this happens up to a certain threshold, which currently sits at 100,000 rand. Now, since the financial sector law amendment bill was first published in 2018, Monaco has actually been working quite closely with banks to assist them in unpacking the perceived requirements and rules for the deposit insurance in South Africa, as well as also ensuring that they are adequately prepared for what's to come. Now, one of the biggest developments over the past year when it comes to deposit insurance was the release of Cody's data discussion paper, which essentially builds on previous discussion paper and also aims to provide banks with a detailed understanding of Cody's data requirements, porting options, as well as your technology proposals that are set out within the paper itself. Now, that's where a lot of the work is currently sitting for banks at the moment. So it's it's now a matter of really understanding those requirements, forming a gap analysis between the requirements and existing infrastructure, and identifying deficiencies, and then making the appropriate changes to ensure that, you know, banks can fully comply to the regulations once they are promulgated. Yeah, I think what we've noticed is that the banks have been 
working on this for for many many months um, and now you know with those papers coming out there's more and more detail uh, and going into to working out those various tricky issues they might not have thought about previously so talking about going through the operationalization of those requirements you know that's where we often talk about where Monaco comes in, taking those requirements and, and making them to practical outcomes. And I know we've been working, particularly when it comes to deposit insurance, with most of the South African or the largest South African banks on this topic. So maybe you can just give us a bit of context or a bit of insights into what have been some of the biggest challenges, like you'd mentioned with the papers for deposit insurance, but what have been the biggest challenges for meeting these bank resolution requirements, particularly with promulgation coming so soon for FSLAB, you know, what does 2022 hold for these projects and, and how is Monaco going to be involved? Yeah, so that's a great question to ask given where we currently are with these regulations. And with the FS Lab set to be promulgated probably later this year, you know, having recently just been passed in Parliament and sent for presidential assessment, banks will be under a lot of pressure this year to demonstrate that their resolution plans are fit for purpose. And they'll also need to officially report back to the Saab in this regard, right? Now, this report will need to include details such as your resolution planning, testing, you know, your relevant governance processes, as well as your operational continuity and your resolution arrangements. So, you know, banks will need to ensure that they have the appropriate processes, controls and systems in place to conduct the valuations in resolution. And this really requires a significant amount of data, model testing, validation, as well as just general active oversight throughout the whole process itself. So given the technical aspects of you know, what lies ahead for banks, banks will need the specialized services and resources of a firm like Monocle to support the banking resolution planning and to also ensure that the regulatory expectations that are set to come are fully met. So thanks, Titi. I mean, there's definitely an immense amount of momentum on these topics. And it seems like banks are going to be busy with this for the next couple of months. I think an important part of it will be for Monaco, as well as our clients, to be keeping an ear out and watching for these papers as they release and more details kind of made known so that we can meet those challenges, those operational challenges as they come up. But in the end, it's creating, like you mentioned, a, a safer banking environment, which is especially important when we look at um, events like VBS and the global financial crisis previously. So even though, they, like you mentioned, there is, it's difficult for banks, it's intensive for banks, especially with deposit insurance, the ultimate result is worth a, a huge amount for financial stability. Yeah, so Titi, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast and uh, sharing your thoughts. It's, it's great to have you finally on the podcast. Thank you so much, Guy. It was really a pleasure to be here. And for our listeners who would like to learn more about what we do at Monaco, you can visit our website to understand our core expertise and view our range of insights and Monaco case studies. Similarly, if you'd like to contact us, you can find all our details on our website for both our European and our South African practices. Titi, again, thanks very much. And to our listeners, thank you for listening. Visit monoclesolutions.com to subscribe for updates. From Johannesburg to London, Cape Town to Amsterdam, Monocle, we design change.